Welcome back. In this video, we'll look at the failed Copernican revolution. So there are several lessons to be learned. Uh, first, scientists are justifiably fearful of presenting unpopular scientific information that is too complex for others to understand and as opposed to the general consensus. Second, uh, when scientists present even controversial information in scholarly works, it does, generally does not result in consequences from the general public. Third, there are personal and social repercussions for those who engage in arguments with the public that support unpopular concepts. Uh, fourth, mistakes in presentations hinder the cause of promoting a scientific idea. And fifth, a consequence for ignoring data is found in this case, as it usually is, so let's look at, the, look at the timeline. Copernicus worked on the heliocentric model for 40 years, uh, and then he published the work at the end of his life, 1643. The work was only accepted by a few scientists. And then uh, Galileo and Kepler uh, published information between 1597 and 1633, where they presented arguments for the Copernican model, which weren't accepted. And then Descartes, as a consequence of this lack of acceptance by the church, um, actually began modern philosophy. And then uh, finally, uh, Newton published his Law of Gravity in 1687, which synthesized observation and theory. So Nicholas Copernicus worked at uh, this cathedral in what was first Poland and then became Prussia. He'd been educated in Italy. He was a canon at the Frombert Cathedral, which meant he was a member of the clergy, took a vow of celibacy, lived with priests and other clergy, engaged in uh, activities such as singing and scripture reading in the morning and so on, as you word it, would in a community of faith. And he worked on his research in his spare time. Uh, the location of Frombert is in Royal Prussia at the north northern end of the country on the water. He lived during a time of political and ecclesiastical chaos. There was the Protestant revolt in Northern Europe, also called the Reformation. There was the sack of Rome in, 19, in uh, 1527. There was Henry VIII's rebellion in England at approximately the same time. There was mil military conflict between France and Spain and that affected Italy. And there were also uh, actually very bad activities going on in the new world where they were, and actually Pope Clement VII, this is his picture, endorsed conversion by the sword in contrast to his predecessors. But in Pope Clement VII's favor, he supported the arts and he supported science and he strongly supported uh, Copernicus publication. So Copernicus found great pleasure in science. I'll just read this. Although, this is a, his preface to his book. Although all the good arts serve to draw man's mind away from vices and lead it toward better things, this function can be more fully uh, performed by this art, which also provides, talking about astronomy, extraordinary, extraordinary intellectual pleasure. For when a man is occupied with things which he sees established in the finest order and directed by divine management, will not the unremitting contemplation of them and a certain familiarity with them stimulate him to the best and to admiration for the maker of everything in whom are all happiness and every good. He first learned of this uh, heliocentric theory by studying ancient Greeks such as uh, Pythagoras, and at first he thought it sounded very absurd, you know, because it seems like we're on a stable earth. But after long and intense study where he observed the movement of the planets night after night uh, from his uh, cathedral watchtower, um, he plotted their positions with geometry. And he found that, yes, the um, heliocentric model was correct. Copernicus preferred to keep his information private, but his friends encouraged him to publish. So um, he first wrote a small volume in 1514 and shared it with a few colleagues because he did not want to be ridiculed by ignorant people who constitute the majority. 
meaning most people wouldn't understand it and would ridicule him. But um, people like Nicholas Schonberg encouraged him to publish. Uh, people shared his information with the Pope, who was delighted by it, and also encouraged uh, Copernicus to publish. So this is um, the main points in his document. Um, he had this heliocentric model with the sun at the center, then Mercury, Venus, Earth and Moon, Mars. And so he said the Earth moves, the Earth rotates, and all planets orbit the sun, which as you can imagine, is completely contrary to what was previously believed. He um, erroneously believed that the planets moved on celestial spheres, you know, crystalline spheres, uh, and they thought the entire heavens was spherical, which was not correct. So what was the response? Almost everyone opposed it, as Copernicus expected, but he published it in the year he died, so it really didn't matter. Although there had been some discussion and opposition before he died. Um, but I'm just going to give three examples of what Protestant leaders said. Uh, and I'm not trying to get down on Protestants. I'm a Protestant myself but it's just the examples I found, they're kind of funny. So Melanchthon was a leading uh, Protestant scholar. He said that Copernicus theory was against tradition senses in the Bible. Copernicus just wanted to be novel. So the gray is what uh, Melanchthon actually wrote. Copernicus just wanted to be novel and show how clever he was and governments should suppress the heliocentric theory. Martin Luther in his table talk he compared it to the idiocy of a person in a carriage thinking that the world is moving and his carriage is standing still. Uh, he said Copernicus wishes to be clever, but is a fool. And he said the heliocentric solar system is opposed to scripture. Gave some examples, such as the sun stopping in Joshua. And John Calvin uh, said Copernicus is deranged and monstrous. Copernicus is possessed by the devil. So as Copernicus thought, his theory wouldn't be very popular. But Copernicus said, if there should chance to be any exegetes ignorant of mathematics who pretend to skill in that discipline and dare to condemn and censure this hypothesis of mine upon the authority of some scriptural passage twisted to their purpose, I value them not, but disdain their unconsidered judgment. So I think this was the status uh, pretty much the entire 16th century. Uh, Kepler came along and he um, believed in Copernicanism. His, um, I think his, his professor was Maslin who shared it with him. And so uh, Kepler was a new professor at Tübingen University. And so he studied it in more detail and he came to the conclusion that there was some geometric structure to the universe and you can see this thing over here with, I guess, crystalline spheres. Of course, he was incorrect, but he did have the geometry of the positions of the planets correct. Well, his publication was approved by Tübingen University, which was a U Lutheran university in Austria. Um, but they asked him to take out, and I've looked at them, they're very odd scriptural arguments in su uh, support of the Copernican model. So this is just an example of uh, peer review working. They took out the the poor parts and kept the good parts. Well, Galileo uh, read Ke Kepler's uh, document and he said, he wrote a letter to Kepler. Like you, I accepted the Copernican position several years ago and discovered from thence the causes of many natural effects, which are doubtless inexplic inexplicable by the current theories. I have written up many of my reasons and refutations on the subject, but I have not dared until now to bring them into the open, being warned by the fortunes of Copernicus himself, our master, who procured immortal fame among a few, but stepped down among the great crowd for the foolish or numerous, only to be derided and dishonored. I would dare publish my thoughts if there were many like you, but since there are not, I shall forbear. So Galileo was a fairly famous professor in Italy. And like I said, Copernicus was a new professor in Austria. Well, Copernic Kepler wrote back, I wish, I could only have wished that you who have so profound an insight would choose another way. You advise us by your personal example in a discreetly veiled fashion to retreat before the general ignorance and not to expose ourselves or heedlessly to oppose the violent attacks of the mob of scholars. And in this you follow Plato and Pythagoras, our true preceptors, 
But after a tremendous task has been begun in our time, first by Copernicus, and then by many very learned mathematicians, and when the assertion that the earth moves can no longer be considered something new, would it not be much better to pull the wagon to its goal by our joint efforts now that we have got it underway and gradually with powerful voices to shout down the common herd, which really does not weigh the arguments very carefully. And letter continues. Thus, perhaps by cleverness, we may bring it to a knowledge of the truth. With your arguments, you would just, you would at the same time help your comrades who endure so many unjust judgments for they would obtain either comfort from your agreement or protection from your influential position. It is not only your Italians who cannot believe that they move if they do not feel it, meaning they didn't think the earth was moving because it seems stable. But we in Germany also do not by any means endear ourselves with this idea. Yet there are ways by which we protect ourselves against these difficulties. And he goes on later, be of good cheer, Galileo, and come out publicly. If I judge correctly, there are only a few of the distinguished mathematicians of Europe who would part company with us. So great is the power of truth. If Italy seems a less favorable place for your publication, and if you look for difficulties there, perhaps Germany will allow us this freedom. So now you can see the general status of the Copernican model, not very popular. Copernicus, I mean, Kepler was probably helped by his association with Emperor Rudolf. So Emperor Rudolf was interested in science, occult astrology. I guess there wasn't science at the time, but knowledge, alchemy. And he supported uh, Brahe's observatory. And after Kepler published this information, he went to work at Brahe's observatory and then Brahe died. And then uh, the Emperor Rudolf, after the publication, who was, and Rudolf was Catholic. He made, even though Kepler was Protestant, he made Kepler imperial mathematician. His main interest in Kepler was to get astrological advice from Kepler. And Kepler was known as an astrologer. He did not like this task, but saw it as a necessary evil to continue his work in astronomy. Well, a decade later, Galileo invented the telescope and he was able to see objects in the solar system which proved the Copernican model. So he showed that the moons were orbiting Jupiter, which meant that everything wasn't orbiting the Earth, as was thought by Aristotle. He showed that Venus had phases, which meant that it was orbiting the sun. I'm not going to explain why here, but it's strong evidence that Venus was orbiting the sun. Uh, he could see the moon more clearly with his telescope. So after his telescope observations, Galileo thought he had proof of the Copernican model. So he boldly came out in favor of Copernicanism. He wrote um, two publications in 1612. One was a letter on sunspot, sunspots to support the Copernican model. And then he also wrote a long uh, document on um, buoyancy, which contradicted Aristotle's uh, laws of buoyancy. Aristotle did not believe in experiments, so he was almost wrong about everything. So he had he used logic, but he didn't check his ideas with experiments. Now, I was looking carefully to see if Galileo was being rude and disrespectful at this time, and he wasn't. The writing was reasonably polite. Uh, he was just stating facts. But as in general, when you just state facts that oppose the general consensus, People interpret what you're saying as hostile and as you being biased. So there was an opposition at this time um, instigated by Galileo's, uh, if you want to call it hostility, but really it was just presentation of facts. <laughs> so the first opposition actually came from a German Jesuit. Those are Catholics, uh, Nicholas Serrarius. Um, he wrote a book in 1612. And then there had been an unpublished book uh, by Tolosani, and this is indicative of the arguments. He said, there's no way to measure that the earth is moving. Copernicus sought data to prove his theory rather than develop his theory based on data. And Copernicus used mathematics, which Tolosani said was the inferior theory to prove physics, which is the superior theory rather than vice versa. So then Caccini uh, used Tolosani's arguments in 1613 sermon. And then in a 16 deposition to the Holy Office, 
now we're talking about the Inquisition, Catholic Inquisition. And so then Galileo, in response, wrote this open letter, supposedly to Christina, but open to everyone. And this is, he's becoming more hostile. Uh, to this end, this is what he said, to this end, they hurled various charges and published numerous writings filled with vain arguments. And they made the grave mistake of sprinkling these with passages taken from places in the Bible, which they had failed to understand properly and which were ill suited to their purposes. So I'm just going to, the letter was 40 pages. I'm just going to give a few quotes from the letter. Uh, this is what he thought about um, the purpose of scripture. Uh, those propositions uttered by the Holy Ghost were set down in that manner by the sacred scribes in order to accommodate them to the capacities of the common people who are rude and unlearned. That the intention of the Holy Ghost is to teach us how one goes to heaven, not how heaven goes. With regard to this argument, I think in the first place that it is very pious to say and prudent to affirm that the Holy Bible can never speak untruth whenever its true meaning is understood, but I believe nobody will deny that it is often very abstruse and may say things which are quite different from what its bare words signify. And he also argued that if science clearly shows something and you have a questionable interpretation from the Bible, you should go with science. And he quoted St. Augustine for this purpose. He said, St. Augustine, we read, if anyone shall set the authority of Holy Writ against clear and manifest reason, he who does this knows not what he has undertaken, for he opposes to the truth, not the meaning of the Bible, which is beyond his comprehension, but rather his own interpretation. Well, all this was not very popular with the Catholic Church at the time in Italy. And so we um, meet Cardinal Bellarmine, who was sort of in charge of doctrine and the uh, purity of the church, I guess. So Bellarmine, he was second in charge to the Pope. Bellarmine consulted with Jesuit astrologers who agreed that Galileo had shown that the Poly Ptolemy was wrong, meaning geocentrism was wrong. Ptolemy supported Aristotle's model, but had not proven that heliocentrism was correct. And that is actually true. And this was true because Copernicus had a lack of precision in his small instruments used at the church. And also Copernicus assumed that the planets orbit in perf orbited in perfect circles, which they didn't. They orbited in slightly elliptical circles. So they were correct. Uh, you could not say that Copernicus had proven his model at that time. So um, the Inquisition told Galileo not to state that Copernic the Copernican system was true and Galileo agreed not to speak of it. Well, at the same time, between 1609 and 1619, Kepler um, used Brahe's data, which had been collected with massive instruments, much more precise than Co Co Copernicus data. And Kepler came up with the correct elliptical descriptions of planetary motion. And he had the correct description of speed of, of the planets as a function of distance from the sun. And so you could say that this was proof of Copernicanism. Interesting that Galileo did not use this information in his arguments in the 1620s. He alluded to them, but he really seems like it would have been so simple just to plot the positions and to show how perfectly the uh, elliptical circles agree with Brahe's data. It's possible, he did mention Kepler, so it wasn't totally against Kepler, but it's possible that um, it was because Kepler was a Protestant who were viewed as heretics in Italy and possibly because Galileo just thought the church would ignore mathematical arguments. So by 1619, Kepler had published his third law of planetary motion. There were three of them where he showed that the positions of the planets, the speed of the planets was a function of distance from the sun, which indicates that there were mechanistic forces involved in keeping the planets in their orbits. And this was actually, or this is attributed, or this scientific res revolution is attributed to this observation, that it's, that it's not angels pushing the planets, but it's mechanistic forces. Uh, Kepler did not come up with a formula for gravity, which Newton would come up with about a century, not a century later, but 60 years later. I think that um, Galileo alluded to this observation, 
I hold the sun to be situated in his letter to Christina. I hold the sun to be situated motionless in the center of the revolution of the celestial orbs while the earth rotates on its axis and revolves around the sun, especially some pertaining to physical effects whose causes per not, perhaps whose causes perhaps cannot be determined in any other way and other astronomical discoveries. So he might be alluding to the, the observation that there were physical effects causing the motion of the planets. Kepler also gave some uh, scriptural arguments against the idea that the Bible supports uh, Aristotelianism or geocentrism. So he said, now the Holy Scriptures speak with humans in the human manner. And then he um, looked at Psalm 19, where he said that the fact that the sun rises at one end of the heavens and, and goes to the other uh, does not mean that the sun is going around the earth, but it's meant to be poetical. And then he alluded to the uh, scripture in Joshua that said the sun is not moving. And he said, well, that could just as easily mean the earth is not spinning at that the time when the sun. Um, so we can get into all sorts of things like the change of momentum and how that would be impossible. But of course, a miracle is not constrained to physical laws. So there was a battle where the sun stopped moving and, and Joshua won a battle. And so then he, he referred to Ecclesiastes 1.4, a generation passes away and a generation comes, but the earth stands forever. And he said, this does not mean that the earth never moves, but that men are transitory in comparison to the immutability of the earth. So Galileo had obeyed the edict from the previous Pope, Pope Gregory, but he died. And I think there was one intermediate Pope, but then Pope Urban came on the scene in 1623 he was friendlier to Galileo than the previous Pope. So Galileo pleaded with a Pope Urban for two years to allow him to publish a new book on heliocentrism. And the Pope eventually acquiesced, but asked Galileo to also include arguments for geocentrism in his book, which sounds reasonable. So Galileo finally came out with his book in uh, 1932 and in the preface, preface, he said, um, several years ago, there was published in Rome a salutary edict, which in order to obviate the dangerous tendencies of our present age, imposed a seasonable silence upon the Pythagorean or Copernican opinion that the earth moves. There were those who impudently inserted that this decree had its origin, not in judicious inquire, but in passion, none too well informed. Complaints were to be heard that advisors who were totally unskilled at astronomical observations ought not to clip the wings of reflective intellects by means of rash prohibitions. So it's obvious in his um, preface to the book that he's somewhat bitter. Galileo is bitter at this time against how he was treated, which is, I mean, I can imagine that um, maybe anybody would feel that way. And he goes on in his preface, upon hearing such carping insolence, my eel could not be contained being thoroughly informed about that prudent determination. I decided to appear openly in the theater of the world as a witness of the sober truth. I was at that time in Rome. I was not only received by the most eminent prelates of that court, but had their applause. Indeed, this decree was not published without some previous notice of it having been given to me. Therefore, I propose in the present work to show to foreign nations that as much is understood of this matter in Italy, and particularly in Rome, as transalpine, which I don't understand, diligence can ever have imagined. So I, I went through the dialogue briefly. Um, it's interesting that he did not use mathematical arguments from Kepler and the accurate positions from Brahe, which would seem to be the proof uh, to mathematically prove the path of the planets. Um, it's, it's very complicated to read this book. It's, an, it's a dialogue between different people about different arguments. And I guess that's the style of argument at the time. But it's not straightforward. And then his great mistake was he put the arguments for geocentrism in the mouth of a somewhat foolish character who he named Simplicio, which meant simpleton. And this book... Um, was insulting to the Pope and the church because they believed in the perspective of Simplicio. Uh, 
And simplicio meant fool, basically. So we put all the arguments for geocentrism in the mouth of a fool, which maybe you can't blame Galileo, but was that really the best course of action? Well, in response, the Catholic Church did not believe him, placed him under house arrest in 1633 for the last 10 years of his life, and the church aligned with geocentrism for the next century or two. And like I said, it would have been much straight, simpler to present straightforward mathematical and visual proofs and to present a straightforward argument for the other side as well. We can only wonder what might have happened. Well, let's summarize the arguments um, of the church against Galileo at the time. Those who opposed the heliocentric model argued that it was impossible to derive a model of the universe based on the faint light of stars. So they're saying you can't make a model of the universe based on these, the movements of these faint planets out in space. And they question the validity of scientific data. They argued that scripture is against it. They also said there's no equation for gravity or the movement of the planets. So as a result, the ability to observe and interpret data became a huge controversy in the 17th century. And it's only because they sought to discredit heliocentrism. Now, Kepler argued against these arguments in a book he wrote called Ad Vitellionum. He said, light is composed of forms and visual rays. Images were causal effects, stains of light, which actually dently bounced off of objects and fell on screens. Images represented reality and that we can trust observation and images Causes could be discerned in the observations of the planet. So he's saying we can observe where the planets are and we can come up with models of their rotation around the sun. Well, one of Kepler's associates was Descartes. And so they even got to the point of trying to determine how images reach the brain through the eye. And then Descartes began to struggle with the legitimacy of any information and he also struggled with our ability to reason as we process the information. And he even questioned his own existence and the existence of God. He finally resolved his dilemma with the famous statement, I think, therefore I am. But this was actually the beginning of modern philosophy. So what the church had done by resisting Copernicanism, this is my theory, is they had opened the door to modern philosophy being the basis of truth rather than religious, the Bible. So rather than accepting religious authorities and texts as a source of, source of truth, Descartes advocated human reason as the path to knowledge. And this must have been partially due to his, the objections of the church, the model, you know, stating that actually the Bible disagrees with the correct data and insisting that this correct model was against scripture. So they kind of forced him into a corner. Well, although um, Descartes evidently proved uh, God's existence to himself, the result of Descartes' approach was that man became the arbiter of truth rather than um, the Bible in modern Western philosophy. And to me, that's, the that's why I say the failed Copernican revolution. Actually, what it resulted in was the discrediting of the Bible and putting man in the place of the arbiter of truth. And that's not really what um, Copernicus, Kepler, Galileo, or any of the proponents of Copernicus were Copernicanism were after. Well, I just wanna um, touch on Isaac Newton. Um, he's possibly the most brilliant scientist in history. He, uh, he finally disproved Aristotle's laws of motion and then he proved that a balance of gravity and centrifugal force is the cause of planetary movement. That's what causes the elliptical movement and Kepler's um, three laws. And um, one thing people, uh, a lot of people realize, but one thing I'd like to point out is Isaac Newton was just as interested in the spiritual side of life than the scientific side of life. I think he spent just as much time studying the Bible as science uh, based on the Bible, he predicted the world would end in 2060. And he was actually anti-Trinitarian. He did not think Christ was God. He thought um, that was incorrect. Um, now that a few other interesting points. 
Um, he remained celibate his entire life. And as with Copernicus, he thought that science enabled a pure mind. We'll see you next time.